Outside the large single window, the crepuscular light was dying out slowly in a great square gleam without color, framed rigidly in the gathering shades of the room. It was a long room. The irresistible tide of the night ran into the most distant part of it, where the whispering of a man's voice, passionately interrupted and passionately renewed, seemed to plead against the answering murmurs of infinite sadness. At last, no answering murmur came. His movement, when he rose, slowly from his knees by the side of the deep, shadowy couch, holding the shadowy suggestion of a reclining woman, revealed him tall under the low ceiling, and somber all over, except for the crude discord of the white collar under the shape of his head, and the faint, minute spark of a brass button here and there on his uniform. He stood over her a moment, masculine and mysterious in his immobility, before he sat down on a chair nearby. He could see only the faint oval of her upturned face, extended on her black dress, her pale hands, a moment before abandoned to his kisses, and now as if too weary to move. He dared not make a sound, shrinking as a man would do from the prosaic necessities of existence. As usual, it was the woman who had the courage. Her voice was heard first, almost conventional, while her being vibrated yet with conflicting emotions. Tell me something, she said. The darkness hid his surprise and then his smile. He had not just said to her everything worth saying in the world, and that not for the first time. What am I to tell you, he asked in a voice creditably steady. He was beginning to feel grateful to her for that something final in her tone, which had eased the strain. Why not tell me a tale? A tale? He was really amazed. Yes, why not? These words came with a slight petulance, the hint of a loved woman's capricious will, which is capricious only because it feels itself to be a law, embracing sometimes and always difficult to elude. Why not, he repeated, with a slightly mocking accent, as though he had been asked to give her the moon. But now he was feeling a little angry with her, for that feminine mobility that slips out of an emotion as easily as out of a splendid gown. He had heard her say, a little unsteadily, with a sort of fluttering intonation, which made him think suddenly of a butterfly's flight, You used to tell your, your simple and, and professional tales very well at one time, or well enough to interest me. You had a a sort of art in those days, the days before the war. Really, he said with involuntary gloom. But now you see the war is going on, he continued, in such a dead, equable tone that she felt a slight chill fall over her shoulders. And yet she persisted, for there's nothing more unswerving in the world than a woman's caprice. It could be a tale not of this world, she explained. You want a tale of the other, the better world, he asked, with a matter-of-fact surprise. You must evoke for the task of those who have already gone there. No, I don't mean that. I mean another, some other world, in the universe, not in heaven. I am relieved, but you forget that I have only five days' leave. Yes, and I have also taken five days' leave from, from my duties. I like that word. What word? Duty. It is horrible sometimes. Oh, that's because you think it's narrow, but it isn't. It contains infinities, and, and so, what is this jargon? He disregarded the interjected scorn. An infinity of absolution, for instance, he continued, but as to this another world, 
Who's going to look for it and for the tale that is in it? You, she said, with a strange, almost rough sweetness of assertion. He made a shadowy movement of assent in his chair, the irony of which not even the gathered darkness could render mysterious. As you will, in that world, then, there was once upon a time a commanding officer and a northman. Put in the capitals, please, because they had no other names. It was a world of seas and continents and islands. Like the earth, she murmured bitterly. Yes, what else could you expect from sending a man made of our common tormented clay on a voyage of discovery? What else could he find? What else could you understand or care for or feel the existence of even? There was comedy in it and slaughter. Always like the earth, she murmured, always. And since I could find in the universe only what was deeply rooted in the fibers of my being, there was love in it, too. But we won't talk of that. No, we won't, she said in a neutral tone, which concealed perfectly her relief or her disappointment. Then, after a pause, she added, it's going to be a comic story. In a way, in a very grim way, it will be human. And as you know, comedy is but a matter of the visual angle. And it won't be a noisy story. All the lung guns and it will be dumb, as dumb as so many telescopes. Ah, there are guns in it then. And may I ask, where? Afloat. You remember that the world of which we speak had its seas. A war was going on in it. It was funny work and terribly in earnest. Its war was being carried on over the land, over the water, under the water, up in the air, and even under the ground, and many young men in it, mostly in ward rooms and mess rooms, used to say to each other, pardon the unparliamentary word, they used to say, it's a damned bad war, but it's better than no war at all. Sounds flippant, doesn't it? He heard a nervous, impatient sigh in the depths of the couch while he went on without a pause. And yet there is more in it than meets the eye. I mean more wisdom. Flippancy, like comedy, is but a matter of visual first impression. That world was not very wise, but there was in it a certain amount of common working sagacity. That, however, was mostly worked by the neutrals, in diverse ways, public and private, which had to be watched, watched by acute minds, and also by actual sharp eyes. They had to be very sharp indeed, too, I assure you. I can imagine, she murmured appreciatively. What is there that you can't imagine, he pronounced soberly. You have the world in you. But let us go back to our commanding officer, who, of course, commanded a ship of a sort. My tales, if often professional, as you remarked just now, have never been technical. So I'll just tell you that the ship was of a very ornamental sort one, with lots of grace and elegance and luxury about her. Yes, once. She was like a pretty woman who had suddenly put on a suit of sackcloth and stuck revolvers in her belt but she floated lightly, she moved nimbly, she was quite good enough. That was the opinion of the commanding officer, said the voice from the couch. It was. He used to be sent out with her along certain coasts to see what he could see, just that, and sometimes he had some preliminary information to help him, and sometimes he had not, and it was all one, really. It was about as useful as information trying to convey the locality and intentions of a cloud, of a phantom taking shape here and there, and impossible to seize, would have been. It was in the early days of the war. What it first used to amaze the commanding officer was the unchanged face of the waters, 
with its familiar expression, neither more friendly nor more hostile. On fine days the sun strikes sparks upon the blue, and here and there a peaceful smudge of smoke hangs in the distance, and it is impossible to believe that the familiar clear horizon traces the limit of one great circular ambush. Yes, it is impossible to believe, till some day you see a ship not your own. That isn't so impressive. But some ship in the company blow up all of a sudden and plop under almost before you know what has happened to her. Then you begin to believe. Henceforth you go out for the work to see what you can see, and you keep on at it with the conviction that some day you will die from something you have not seen. One envies the soldiers at the end of the day wiping the sweat and blood from their faces, counting the dead fallen to their hands, looking at the devastated fields, the torn earth that seems to suffer and bleed with them. One does really. The final brutality of it, the taste of primitive passion, the ferocious frankness of the blow struck with one's hand, the direct call and the straight response. Well, the sea gave you nothing of that and seemed to pretend that there was nothing the matter with the world. She interrupted, stirring a little. Oh, yes, sincerity, frankness, passion. Three words of your gospel. Don't I know them? Think, isn't it ours, believed in common, he asked anxiously, yet without expecting an answer, and went on at once. Such were the feelings of the commanding officer when the night came, trailing over the sea, hiding what looked like the hypocrisy of an old friend. It was a relief. The night blinds you frankly, and there are circumstances when the sunlight may grow as odious to one as falsehood itself. Night is all right. At night the commanding officer could let his thoughts get away. I won't tell you where. Somewhere where there was no choice but between truth and death. But thick weather, though it blinded one, brought no such relief. Mist is deceitful. The dead luminosity of fog is irritating. It seems that you ought to see. One gloomy, nasty day, the ship was steaming along her beat in the sight of a rocky, dangerous coast that stood out intensely black like an India ink drawing on gray paper. Presently, the second-in-command spoke to his chief. He thought he saw something on the water to seaward, small wreckage, perhaps. But there shouldn't be any wreckage here, sir, he remarked. No, said the commanding officer. The last reported submarined ships were sunk a long way to the westward. But one never knows. There may have been others since then, not reported nor seen, gone with all hands. That was how it began. The ship's course was altered to pass the object close, for it was necessary to have a good look at what one could see, close but without touching, for it was not advisable to come in contact with objects of any form, whatever, floating casually by. Close but without stopping or even diminishing speed, for in those times it was not prudent to linger on any particular spot, even for a moment. I may tell you at once that the object was not dangerous in itself. No use in describing it. It may have been nothing more remarkable than, say, a barrel of a certain shape and color, but it was significant. The smooth bow wave hove it up as if for a closer inspection, and then the ship, brought again to her course, turned her back on it with indifference, while twenty pairs of eyes on her deck stared in all directions trying to see what they could see. The commanding officer and his second-in-command discussed the object with uncertainty. It appeared to them to be not so much a proof of the sagacity 
as of the activity of certain neutrals. This activity had, in many cases, taken the form of replenishing the stories of certain submarines at sea. This was generally believed, if not absolutely known. But the very nature of things in those early days pointed that way. The object, looked at closely and turned away from with apparent indifference, put it beyond doubt that something of the sort had been done somewhere in the neighborhood. The object in itself was more than suspect, but the fact of its being left in evidence roused other suspicions. Was it the result of some deep and devilish purpose? As to that, all speculations soon appeared to be a vain thing. Finally, the two officers came to the conclusion that it was left there, most likely by accident, complicated, possibly, by some unforeseen necessity, such, perhaps, as the sudden need to get away quickly from the spot, or something of that kind. Their discussion had been carried on in curt, weighty phrases, separated by long, thoughtful silences, and all the time their eyes roamed about the horizon in an everlasting, almost mechanical effort of vigilance. The younger man summed up grimly, Well, it's evidence. Evidence of what we were pretty certain of before, and plain, too. And much good it will do to us, retorted the commanding officer. The parties are miles away. The submarine, devil only knows, we're ready to kill, and the noble, neutral, slipping away to the eastward, ready to lie. The second-in-command laughed a little at that tone, but he guessed that the neutral wouldn't even have to lie very much. Fellows like that, unless caught in the very act, felt themselves pretty safe. They could afford to chuckle. That fellow was probably chuckling to himself. It's very possible he had been before at the game and didn't care a rap for the bit of evidence left behind. It was a game in which practice made one bold and successful, too. And again he laughed faintly, but his commanding officer was in revolt against the murderous stealthiness of methods and the atrocious callousness of complicities that seemed to taint the very source of men's deep emotions and noblest activities to corrupt their imagination which builds up the final conceptions of life and death. He suffered. The voice from the sofa interrupted the narrator. How well can I understand that in him? He bent forward slightly. Yes, I too. Everything should be open in love and war, open as the day, since both are the call of an ideal which is so easily so terribly easy to degrade in the name of victory. He paused, then went on. I don't know that the commanding officer delved so deep as that into his feelings, but he did suffer from them a sort of disenchanted sadness. It is possible, even, that he suspected himself of folly. Man is various, but he had no time for much introspection because from the southwest a wall of fog had advanced upon his ship. Great convolutions of vapors flew over, swirling about masts and funnel, which looked as if they were beginning to melt. Then they vanished. The ship was stopped. All sounds ceased, and the very fog became motionless, growing denser, and as if solid, in its amazing, dumb immobility. The men at their stations lost sight of each other. Footsteps sounded stealthily. Rare voices, impersonal and remote, died out without resonance. A blind, white stillness took possession of the world. It looked, too, as if it would last for days. I don't mean to say that the fog did not vary a little in its density, and now and then it would thin out mysteriously, revealing to the men a more or less ghostly presentment of their ship. Several times 
The shadow of the coast itself swam darkly before their eyes through the fluctuating opaque brightness of the great white cloud clinging to the water. Taking advantage of these moments, the ship had been moved cautiously nearer the shore. It was useless to remain out in such thick weather. Her officers knew every nook and cranny of the coast along their beat. They thought that they should be much better in, in a certain cove. It wasn't a large place, just ample room for a ship to swing at her anchor. She would have an easier time of it till the fog lifted. Slowly, with infinite caution and patience, they crept closer and closer, seeing no more of the cliffs than an evanescent dark loom with a narrow border of angry foam at its feet. At the moment of anchoring, the fog was so thick that for all they could see, they might have been a thousand miles out and the open sea, yet the shelter of the land could be felt. There was a peculiar quality in the stillness of the air, very faint, very elusive. The wash of the ripple against the encircling land reached their ears with mysterious sudden pauses. The anchor dropped, the leads were laid in, the commanding officer went below into his cabin, but he had not been there very long when a voice outside his door requested his presence on deck. He thought to himself, what is it now? He felt some impatience at being called out again to face the wearisome fog. He found that it had thinned again a little and had taken on a gloomy hue from the dark cliffs which had no form, no outline, but asserted themselves as a curtain of shadows all round the ship, except one bright spot, which was the entrance from the open sea. Several officers were looking that way from the bridge. The second in command met him with the breathlessly whispered information that there was another ship in the cove. She had been made out by several pairs of eyes only a couple of minutes before. She was lying at anchor very near the entrance, a mere vague blot on the fog's brightness, and the commanding officer, by staring in the direction, pointed out to him by eager hands, ended by distinguishing it at last himself, indubitably a vessel of some sort. It's a wonder we didn't run slap into her when coming in, observed the second in command. Send a boat on board before she vanishes, said the commanding officer. He surmised that this was a coaster. It could hardly be anything else. But another thought came into his head suddenly. It is a wonder, he said to his second command, who had rejoined him after sending the boat away. By that time, both of them had been struck by the fact that the ship so suddenly discovered had not manifested her presence by ringing her bell. We came in very quietly, that's true, concluded the young officer, but they must have heard our leadsman at least. We couldn't have passed her more than fifty yards off. The closest shave. They may even have made us out, since they were aware of something coming in. And the strange thing is that we never heard a sound from her. The fellows on board must have been holding their breath. Hey, said the commanding officer thoughtfully. In due course, the boarding boat returned, appearing suddenly alongside, as though she had burrowed her way under the fog. The officer in charge came up to make his report, but the commanding officer didn't give him time to begin. He cried from a distance, Coaster, isn't she? No, sir, a stranger, a neutral, was the answer. No, really? Well, tell us all about it. What is she doing here? The young man stated that when he had been told a long and complicated story of engine troubles, but it was plausible enough from a strictly professional point of view, and it had the usual features, disablement, dangerous drifting along the shore, weather more or less thick for days, fear of a gale, 
ultimately a resolve to go in and anchor anywhere on the coast, and so on. Fairly plausible. Engines still disabled, inquired the commanding officer. No, sir, she has steam on them. The commanding officer took his second aside. By Jove, he said, you are right. They were holding their breaths as we passed them. They were. But the second-in-command had his doubts now. A fog like this does muffle small sounds, sir, he remarked. And what could his object be, after all? To sneak out unnoticed, answered the commanding officer. Then why didn't he? He might have done it, you know. Now, not exactly unnoticed, perhaps. I didn't suppose he could have slipped his cable without making some noise. Still, in a minute or so, he would have been lost to view, clean gone before we had made him out fairly. Yet he didn't. They looked at each other. The commanding officer shook his head. Such suspicions as the one which he had entertained in his head are not defended easily. He did not even state it openly. The boarding officer finished his report. The cargo of the ship was of harmless and useful character. She was bound to an English port, papers and everything in perfect order, nothing suspicious to be detected anywhere. Then passing to the men, he reported the crew on deck as the usual lot, engineers of the well-known type, and very full of their achievement in repairing the engines, the mate surly, the master rather a fine specimen of a Northman, civil enough, but appeared to have been drinking, seemed to be recovering from a regular bout of it. I told him I couldn't give him permission to proceed. He said he wouldn't dare to move his ship her own length out in such weather as this, permission or no permission. I left a man on board, though. Quite right. The commanding officer, after communing with his suspicions for a time, called his second aside. What if she were the very ship which had been feeding some infernal submarine or other, he said in an undertone. The other started. Then, with conviction, she would get off scot-free. You couldn't prove it, sir. I want to look into it myself. From the report we've heard, I am afraid you couldn't even make a case for reasonable suspicion, sir. I'll go on board all the same. He had made up his mind. Curiosity is the great motive power of hatred and love. What did he expect to find? He could not have told anybody, not even himself. What he really expected to find there was the atmosphere. The atmosphere of gratuitous treachery which, in his view, nothing could excuse, for he thought that even a passion of unrighteousness for its own sake could not excuse that, but could he detect it, sniff it, taste it, receive some mysterious communication which would turn his invincible suspicions into a certitude strong enough to provoke action with all its risks?